There is a question. Question almost as old as Trek itself, which has both intrigued and confused Trekkies for generations. And that question is, what the f*** is the Daedalus class? Now, a lot of you will probably be saying, well, we know what the Daedalus class is. Well, do we? You see, while the Daedalus class is perhaps one of the oldest historical designs in Star Trek, and when I say historical design, I mean a design of a ship that was not in service or only implied to be in service. It's a very old design and, and based, I think, loosely somewhat on some original concept art. I, I don't recall off the top of my head, but it's it's a design that's as old as the original series and has been represented many a times throughout various technical manuals uh, in sort of Apocrypha, Beta Canon Law. Of course, in Deep Space Nine, Cisco has a model of the Daedalus class, the USS Essex. And on top of that, there have been numerous fan interpretations, which I will be just flashing up on the screen before you. There's a lot of them and they're very different, although they're of course based on that very same simple design. Now it's interesting actually, because that design by some is treated as a placeholder, when in reality I feel like we just kind of... I think it perfectly serves as the canon design. You can argue that, oh well, well the original Enterprise, that was a placeholder design. Well it was at least in Gene's mind, but in everyone else's mind, including the makers of Star Trek Picard as it appears, uh, that is the original Enterprise, not the Strange New Worlds Enterprise or anything else. That's the original Enterprise. So, um, while there perhaps might have been an intention to replace the Daedalus model with something a bit more up-to-date, it hasn't really happened. So, we're forced to conclude that, yeah, this is the Daedalus model that we're working with. Aside from the different interpretations of the Daedalus class as to what it even looks like, there's even big questions as to when is the Daedalus class. And that's a lot harder to pin down than you think. People previously thought that it was actually a ship that was very close to original series, like essentially the last generation of starships before the Constitution class. Well, that's not the case anymore. Uh, people then said, okay, well, it's it's the main ship of the 22nd century. Well, it's not that anymore. We're now at a place where we don't know where to put the Daedalus class. We don't know where it fits. Then we've got to ask, okay, why does the Daedalus look the way it does? You see, while it is a very clearly Star Trek design, it's also very different from any other starship that we see on screen. Until, of course, we get the Olympic class in Next Generation. If the Daedalus hadn't existed, you would have just said that that, oh, well, look at that futuristic. You wouldn't have realized that it was in a lineage with the Olympic class. Something to consider. The point being is that, you know, this the whole sphere design does not necessarily um, follow from the, the saucer-based designs that we see in original series onwards. So there's a real question as to why does the Daedalus look so different? Again, particularly when you're considering where to place it in the timeline. Putting it closer or further away to, you know, the things we know gives it sort of less space to make sense on its own. And then finally, we've got to ask, well, what did it actually do? What did this ship do? Because people seem to like this ship in universe. Ben Sisko has a model of it on his desk. What did it do? Why is it everywhere? Why does everyone talk about it? Why are they, why are there wrecks of them everywhere? What were these ships and what did they do? So that's what I'm going to try and answer today. We're going to try and answer what exactly is the Daedalus class? What were its capabilities and what did it do? But before we get to any of that, I want to answer the most important question, which is where did this come from? So take my hand and Come and join me, because things are going to get weird. Alright, so Daedalus class as a design 
originally existed in a vacuum. Again, we can assume that it was some kind of conjectural concept design when they were first drawing up different interpretations of what the Enterprise should look like. And somebody thought, oh, that's still kind of neat. We can, we can use that for something. And there are ships like the Medusan ship in original series that make use of that whole sphere-based design. Because of the existence of Daedalus, now looks very human, although it perhaps didn't look so human back when TOS aired, and our only example of a human ship was the Enterprise, a saucer ship. That's by the by. The point I'm trying to get across is that previously, the Daedalus class existed in a vacuum. It was in an era separate from TOS, where it could obey its own rules and, you know, we don't know how things worked back then, it was just left up to our imaginations, and that was fine. And then Enterprise happened. Now, one of the things that did happen with Enterprise is that there was an attempt to redesign the Daedalus to conform to the Enterprise aesthetic. Now, while aesthetically the redesign does better conform to what we see on screen with the NX class, it doesn't really change any of the essential features. And in so doing, it's still just as confusing as the original design. The problem with the Daedalus is not the, the kind of the angles of certain lines or whatever. It's, it's not certain points of geometry. It's not minor details that set Daedalus apart and make it quite conspicuous. It's the big ball. That's what makes Daedalus so conspicuous and unusual. It's that big ball on the front of it. Changing other details to match those of Enterprise doesn't really help explain what it is or, or how it fits in the universe. You're sort of just kind of... You're trying to wallpaper over a cannonball-shaped hole in the lore. So, I don't think it adds anything, and I don't think it's necessary to explain the Daedalus. I think it also comes down to where do you want to position the Daedalus technologically. Now, if you want to make the Daedalus a new and cutting-edge ship at the time of Enterprise, then yeah, that redesign actually kind of works. But given that we won't see sphere sections in the future, we can assume that this was a dead end of technology. So, okay, maybe you say that the Daedalus was a dead end experiment. Okay, well, but why is it? Why is it such a popular design? That doesn't work. The only thing we can be forced to conclude is that the Daedalus predates the NX class and was old even when the NX was coming out. And then, well, here, here comes a problem. What counts as old for a starship? Fundamentally, we are missing context with the Daedalus class. Now, there is a way to rectify this problem, and the name of this problem, uh, some of you are going to immediately tune out when I say this, is Starfleet Museum. You see, he intended, of course, to design a whole fleet of the 22nd century almost in resistance to Enterprise. Enterprise was not necessarily the most popular show when it came out, and people didn't like some of the lore implications, and the fact that it, it didn't kind of feel as, as retro sci-fi as they perhaps wanted it to be, which is fair enough, you know, it would have been, would have been nice, but it wouldn't have done well, but it didn't do well anyway, so what do I know? The, the point being, when Masao Ukazaki is designing his ships for Starfleet Museum, his main point of reference is Daedalus. He says, I want to get here. This is my end point. I want to start, we're going to start sort of with as basic a shape as we can get, and we're going to move to Daedalus, and then we'll move from Daedalus to sort of deep saucers, down all the way to the saucer sections we see in TOS. Because Enterprise now exists, that kind of obviously competes with that. So what do you do with Starfleet Museum? Well, here's the thing. There's a lot of lost eras in Star Trek, and I've made my best effort to cover them as much as possible. I've covered the big lost era between the end of Star Trek VI and Star Trek The Next Generation. We've basically filled in that whole chunk of timeline, but there's two more lost eras. There's the lost era between the end of Enterprise, the end of the Romulan War, and the formation of the Federation, and original series. Now, if you want to use Discovery to fill in some of that, 
you can do that, you're still only going to fill in about 10 years. There's still a colossal amount of lost era to be contending with. And then on the flip side of that, there's also a big lost era, about 80 years, between the launch of the Phoenix and the launch of the NX-01. Well, what, were humans just not building starships in that time? Of course they were! Now, we don't see any designs from that period, but it's my view that the Maseo Ukazaki designs do actually work in this period, the late 21st and early 22nd century. You see, these ships actually exist somewhat prior and parallel to the NX lineage of ships. The NX lineage of ships, as far as I'm concerned, is a development program that is focused on using antimatter to create a warp 5 ship. That's the target. It's to create a, it's to, by using antimatter energy, build a warp 5 capable ship. That's the end goal of the NX program. And the hope is that that will overshoot and overtake fusion drives. Now, I realize that I'm retconning some of Maseo Ukazaki's ideas. Most of Maseo Ukazaki's human ships are, in fact, uh, antimatter powered, but they also look like they could be fusion powered as well. So that's, that's the little retcon I'm going to make there. Fundamentally, I think, you know, while the NX program is busy dicking around with dilithium crystals and antimatter, the rest of humanity is not going to be wasting time waiting for that. They're going to get out there and do what humans always do, which is, you know, explore and get themselves into trouble. So you need a Starfleet to do so safely and uh, possibly bail out colonists when that happens. So, let's talk about the evolution of fusion drives. So, fusion drives were used to achieve Warp 1, and that enabled humanity to colonize the solar system. At the same time, you also started to get pioneer ships that would basically leave and never be heard from again and there's a reason for that and that reason is that the united earth government began building military vessels and there was a concern among a lot of people on earth that what had just happened on earth you know world war three nuclear exchanges was just going to play out all over again across the entire solar system and that's why you had some pioneers who just left earth and never called the most critical detail of these ships, particularly the ones that were long range, was that they had nacelles in the forward base position because that offered the most fuel efficiency. It didn't give you much in the way of speed or maneuverability, but you, would, you could get where you were going very efficiently on what was comparatively limited power. And that's why a lot of these early ships had nacelles at the fore of the hull rather than the back but that will change. So, Fusion Drive actually beats Antimatter to Warp 2. Antimatter Drive breaks Warp 2 around about 2135-ish. My presumption would be that Fusion Drive achieved Warp 2 probably around the turn of the 22nd century, and that enables realistic expansion over into neighboring systems like Alpha Centauri which is of course where Dr. Cochrane would then move to before his final disappearance. As fusion reactors get more efficient, yes they get smaller they generate, and they generate more power for their size, they also get more radioactive, which is fun. You'll notice, so here we have the lineage that basically leads to the Daedalus. We have at first the Cretchit. The Cretchit had its fusion drive at the back in that little bulb and then that plasma was carried forward. That was okay because it was relatively low energy plasma. However, once you get to the Amarillo class, you have to have the reactor right next to the warp nacelles. The plasma is a lot hotter and a lot more radioactive. You want to actually just keep that well away from the crew. And also you're starting to look at uh, warp field geometry, uh, particularly in a more through a more tactical lens. Uh, with the Cretchit class, you were just looking at getting from A to B at warp drive, yet with the Amarillo class, there's actually a real consideration of having to engage threats while under warp power. Fast forward again, we get to the, the Fireball slash Comet class. It's called two different things, but it's the same ship. 
the, the I think the fireball was the prototype and the production model was the comet class. As you can see, you are moving much more towards that Daedalus kind of shape. You can see the separation between the engineering section and the main crew section. Reason for that is because, well, uh, that fusion reactor, it's a lot more efficient It's and it's also gotten smaller, but it's also a lot more radioactive. So keeping it, again, away from the crew, away from those squishy humans, it's quite important. So that's why that reactor is even further back and separated by a, a sort of a neck section. And then, of course, once we get to the Daedalus class, you have a full uh, boom and a complete and an even greater distance between the, the by now very radioactive Warp 3 fusion reactor and the, the ball section. So, with this in mind, the Daedalus is effectively the, the culmination of this lineage. It also obviously has some influences from the larger cruisers, but I've just chosen to show the smaller designs because they have more discernible sphere sections, which is what we're really looking at the development of. It was probably launched around about 2140, maybe a little bit before. So, it's achieving Warp 3 just as... Antimatter drives are also achieving warp 3, but it's taken far less time for antimatter drive to go from warp 1 to warp 2 to warp 3 than it has taken for fusion drive. And there's also all sorts of other advantages that are provided by antimatter systems. Antimatter, proportional to the amount of energy generates, produces less harmful radiation. It also is much more fuel efficient. Part of the reason that those older ships, the, the Amarillo and the Cretchit, were so big and bulbous is a lot of space was taken up by fuel because those fusion reactors were hungry beasts. And that was that's a problem that Romulan ships of the era also had because they are still running fusion drive and will continue to do so for another hundred years. So, you know, fuel is a big consideration and that explains the very large and, and voluminous shapes in the Daedalus lineage because they have to carry those level of fuel supplies. The And so when the Daedalus is being designed, okay, it's got a warp 3 engine and so, and there's an antimatter warp 3 engine. By the time it's launched in numbers, the Freedom class has just cracked warp 4. So it's now starting to get outpaced. Originally, it was only armed with laser weaponry. Decent lasers, but just lasers. It was not intended for combat with peer, near peer powers. It was intended as an anti-piracy vessel. That's part of why the engineering section was so big. It was so that you could accommodate all the fuel and supplies that you would need for very long patrols along the shipping lanes. And when you're dealing with pirates, all you need is a laser. Uh, heavy ordnance is not required. Another aspect of the design of the Daedalus is that it is built in a much more modular fashion. You can see it's not as homogenized and whole. Part of it is about radiation shielding, but it's also allowing a level of modularity because at this point it is clear that antimatter is going to overtake fusion drive. It's just a matter of time. The designers of the Daedalus class were being very forward thinking and made sure that there was provision in there to to replace the fusion drive with an antimatter drive. That also meant that all the systems, the internal systems, the EPOS grid and everything, had to be rated for antimatter levels of energy, not just fusion levels of energy. It was future-proofed to an extent, because they knew that Warp 5 was on its way. So that's the Daedalus, and it's in service by the time the NX-01 launches, and is just generally patrolling the shipping lanes, along with the newer, more advanced ships like the Intrepid type and the Freedom class. In terms of kind of uh, capability level, it's about on par with the NX Delta or Ganges class. I suppose the thing to think about is, you know, Fusion Drive is what is today uh, a diesel powered ship. It's, it's eminently purchasable and runnable for a civilian undertaking. That is not the case for a nuclear powered aircraft carrier. I doubt anyone is going to be building a nuclear powered freighter in the near future. Uh, but that's kind of the, you know, where the technology is. So 
you know, antimatter is still very expensive, whereas fusion drive, much cheaper. So, Daedalus class is out there doing its thing, doing anti-piracy, policing shipping lanes. It knows that it's going to be overtaken by the by the NX line of ships and that it is going to need uh, refitting with an antimatter reactor. Possibly, depending on how things go, Starfleet might not even bother that and the Daedalus may get an early retirement. But then something happens. The Romulan War. Now, with the Romulans very quickly closing in on Earth, uh, basically Starfleet has to work with what it has to hand. And what it has to hand is a hell of a lot of Daedalus-class ships. So the Daedalus is the most numerous ship of the period. That also means that there's lots of spare parts. That also means that there's a lot of infrastructure that has been tooled up to build these ships or similar kinds of ships. So they're able to be produced in large numbers and quite quickly. But they're not just cannon fodder. Starfleet makes sure that they are very viable and competitive in the war that they find themselves in. They refit it to house a Warp 4 reactor. Now, I say Warp 4 reactor, generally that means it'll sit comfortably at Warp 3 and will push up to somewhere like 3.5, maybe 3.8, and possibly if you push it to nearly exploding, you can get to warp 4. That kind of warp 4 reactor. Not a comfortable one, to be certain. But there are a lot of advantages by fitting this new antimatter reactor. It's a smaller reactor, it requires less fuel. Because antimatter reactors are more efficient than fusion. So there's a lot of leftover space that was taken up with fusion reactor and fuel tanks that you can now use for ordnance. And they put missiles in the Daedalus class. We're talking big missiles, ballistic missiles. In the aft cargo section, you can house a total of 16 ballistic missiles. These are basically SLBMs. They're, they're old submarine launch ballistic missiles. Things like Trident, uh, Polaris, and whatever the Soviet equivalent was. Obviously, there's some retooling going on there. You can't just tell a missile that was designed to that was designed to shoot at large planetary targets to shoot at enemy starships it's not amazing and they're not the most accurate of weapons but they are effective for what the daedalus needs to do at the same time it also carries 16 smaller interceptor missiles these allow it to shoot down incoming missiles which is important because the romulans sent a lot of fusion missiles their way and a very quick note to mention with that is that while individually these uh, missiles, these ballistic missiles, are not that effective, um, or the warheads are not that effective and very likely to be shot down, the way they operate is by saturating Romulan defenses. And Romulan defenses are not designed to counter swarms of warheads. They're designed to counter other smart missiles other smart torpedoes so something like a spatial torpedo which is quite a fast uh, projectile and is also programmed to be evasive uh, there are evasive patterns somewhat programmed into these um, the warheads of the ballistic missiles but they're they're far more limited in what they can do the Romulan's best chance of shooting down these incoming missiles is by destroying the missile before it can launch its warheads. You also have an upgrade to the laser system. This basically just covers the entire sphere section and the aft section in laser emitters. These are less powerful lasers, they're not really anti-starship grade lasers. What they are is anti-missile lasers. They're designed to shoot down incoming missiles that are specifically intended for the ship itself. Whereas the interceptor missiles are there to are there to serve for fleet defense. So they're there to help protect their neighbors who perhaps don't have such a robust anti-missile grid. Remember, the NX line is largely intended to engage at sort of medium range combat. Most of them don't have lasers and are reliant on either their own interceptor torpedoes or plasma turrets, which are far less consistent than their laser equivalents. But there is a balance to this, and this is that the Daedalus class does not have any shields. It's just relying on polarized hull plating. So it is incredibly vulnerable 
to a missile hit. That will kill it. But it's also very vulnerable to energy weapons. So all in all, it's a very vulnerable ship. It's a bit of a glass cannon. If it can take down the projectiles, it's fine. But if it's shot with a directed energy weapon, it's done for. In terms of actually how it performs in combat, the Daedalus class is basically a missile boat that's both in an offensive and defensive way. And it's a sort of, it's a counter battery boat as well. It's designed to shoot down incoming missiles, serve as sort of a kind of a defensive center of whatever squadron or battle group that it's part of. It's there as sort of the defensive centerpiece and there is sort of largely as a as a support vessel. It's good as a support vessel. Like I say, it's very vulnerable at close range to directed energy weapons, especially those Romulan force plasma beams. Those things will just tear through an unshielded ship like it's nothing. Their lasers are useless in ship-to-ship -ship combat, again, especially against Romulan ships that are actually decently armored of this era. You're not going to touch them. So their ballistic missiles are very good because they can launch multiple warheads and like i say romulan interceptor missiles are designed to shoot down single evasive targets not multiple swarming targets now the way the romulans would counter this is getting an interceptor missile off very early to shoot down that missile before it can launch its warheads at a effective range and that's why you have to supplement the daedalus's missile volley with that of uh, ships carrying more modern evasive spatial torpedoes which try to make the Romulan interceptor missiles engage them and deprioritize the ballistic missiles until they're in a position where they can launch their warheads. And even if the MIRVs are launched at too long a range, so if the ballistic missile knows that it's going to be intercepted and destroyed, they'll still launch the warheads. And what you've now done is put a cloud of warheads out into empty space and the enemy doesn't exactly know where they are because those warheads are very small. So what you've actually created is a kind of defensive barrier between yourself and the enemy. Now, of course, in the 3D world of space, you can go around it, but that takes time. It stops the enemy just straight bull rushing you and closing you down very quickly and again melting you with that forced plasma beam. Now, there's a bit of a debate with the Daedalus regarding its survivability. Obviously, a lot of ships survive the war, but equally, they built a lot of these ships. It's really hard to tell. Records of the time are a bit hazy. On one level, it's a standoff vessel. It's designed to fire missiles at range and not get into too close quarters with the enemy. So in that way, you might say, well, of course, it's going to be very survivable because it's hanging back. But it was also a very powerful asset, and the Romulans knew it. So it was always going to be a priority target every time they made a missile launch. Or, if they caught one out of position and unsupported, just charge it down, melt it with the plasma beam. So, debates regarding its survivability. It's difficult to tell when you're hanging back, but you're also a key target for the enemy. Certainly, there were a lot of Daedalus-class ships left after the war. That might be more of a testament to the industrial power of the Coalition more than the individual survivability of the Daedalus-class. Now, post-war, the fleet obviously got demobilized. You have a lot of Daedalus-class ships now lying around, and they're not really at the technological edge, are they? So, basically, they were put into second-line service largely in the recolonization effort. As I say before, the Romulans basically uh, glassed any human colonies they found as they moved towards Earth. And so a lot of colonies had to be repopulated from, from scratch. And the Daedalus was a good way of getting people there, bringing supplies. It was a very effective fleet support ship. That's another thing to mention. Not all Daedalus-class ships were given the missiles. Some were just given the antimatter reactor, and then served as a su fleet support ship. You know, you've got a very cavernous cargo bay in there, and you can use that to carry all sorts of supplies, which are very important for a fleet that might be fighting in deep space or far away from a base. So there were already Daedalus class ships in the fleet support role, but given that their, their combat niche had kind of faded after the Romulan War, 
the rest of the Daedalus class was then pushed into that fleet support role, where it served for many years very, very well. It, it, it acquitted itself very well in that role, um, gave rise to numerous colonies, again, kept Starfleet rolling in those years as the Federation is, as the nascent Federation is developing, and this lasted even into the 23rd century. So let's go back to that question. What is the Daedalus class? The Daedalus class is not a warship. Never was. It's not a ship of the line. And it was not built as one. The Romulan War incarnation of the Daedalus with these nuclear missiles and interceptor missiles and laser defense systems. That's just another role in the many roles that this ship occupied. In reality, the Daedalus was Starfleet's first, and certainly not Starfleet's last, Swiss Army knife. It was a ship that could be adapted for any occasion, and Starfleet found itself in a war with a species that intended to wipe humanity out, and in that respect the Daedalus class rose to that occasion, but when it became time to turn swords into plowshares, the Daedalus was also extremely effective as a plowshare. It was very effective as a utility and support vessel. And that is why the Daedalus was ultimately in service for so long. It was essentially a fleet support vessel that happened to do some shooting and be reasonably good at it when it did. But it was always intended to be a support vessel and was never really intended to be a frontline vessel. Like I say, by the time they were building the Daedalus, they knew that the NX line was going to overtake that previous generation of fusion drive. And, you know, rather than try and compete for that top spot, the designers readily accepted the position of dutiful supply ship. And the result is that the Daedalus managed to outlast a lot of the most cutting edge ships of its time. Because, well, when you're cutting edge, you're also going to be outmoded very quickly because nobody stays cutting edge for long but if you're built well enough to serve multiple roles and be adaptable and flexible for whatever is needed you can always find work and it probably also explains why we see so many different modifications as well thank you guys for watching i hope you enjoyed I know that you guys wanted to see more 22nd century style content. I hope this is kind of what you were looking for. I guess we'll see with how this video does. And please, if you did enjoy the video, thumbs up, like, share, subscribe, all of that good stuff. Leave comments. Always leave comments below. Make sure, uh, let me know what you think of my, uh, my little theory. Um, and I will see you guys in the next video. Thank you to my members, my Navarx, Jeffrey Ballard. Tully DT, and Rella. My commanders, Miami Jules, Captain's Quarters, Chase Rector, PQSK, Philip Ty, Jeff Hallam, Bird Monster, Mark Philippe, Robert Sampson, Sean Farrell, Guillermo Martinez, Das Blas, Adam Bowman, Nathaniel Mead, DM, Tribal Typhoon, Gabe Logan, Mr. Flegel, and Nicholas Walsh. And I salute my centurions, Pendleberry, BOS Domestic Disputes, Marcus Hall, Julian Arnott, Freedom Trooper, Ockel Catum Quaesto, Squadra Course, Athies Collection, and Tobias Klein. And I thank all my loyal sub lieutenants. And I welcome Atia Rasaya and Kevin Murphy. Thank you guys for supporting the channel, and I will see you all in the next video.